Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bob Wilhelm. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development here at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be joining you here today uh, on, in what is our fourth Nebraska lecture for the, for the monthly series that we're running for the N150 celebration. Uh, the goal of the Chancellor's Distinguished uh, Lecture Series is to bring together the university community and also our many friends and partners beyond the university to celebrate the intellectual work that's, being, that's taking place here at the Nebraska Lincoln and also uh, looking for the interaction that we can have with all of our partners uh, and our friends in the community. The presentation highlights our faculty, faculty's excellence in interdisciplinary research and creative activity. The lecture series is sponsored by a number of different groups on campus, both the UNL Research Council in cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, also known as OLLI. I wanna make a special welcome to our many uh, friends, uh, the OLLI members that are here today, and also recognize you. I also want to uh, give special thanks to the Humanities Nebraska and its Executive Director, Chris Summerich, for helping sponsor this year's lectures. Also, th thanks to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we've, we have now this very much ex expanded lecture series for our N150 celebration year. Um, with this support, we've also been able to create podcasts of all of the presentations both for historical purposes and also to make this available to many different audiences, both now and in the future. Uh, I also want to recognize the university's research council, which includes faculty from broad disciplines uh, at the University of Nebraska. This council solicits, no solicits nominations of faculty to present at the Nebraska lectures each year. And th these, uh, the selections are made on the basis of major recent accomplishments, and also the, the lecturer's ability to communicate and to explain their work uh, to, a, to a wide audience. Uh, the, the selection of a, to, to be selected as a Nebraska, Nebraska lecturer is, is one of the highest recognitions for the university, and it's certainly the highest recognition that the council bestows on an individual faculty member. So I, well, I guess I'll look out to the camera and say we're also uh, happy to be welcoming everyone that's joining us on the live webcam and through Facebook Live. Social me media users can use the hashtag NEB, hash, hashtag NEB lecture uh, to offer more comments and questions uh, during the presentation. So just a few words about the format. Uh, after the lecture, Jamie Reimer, chair of the university's research council, will lead and also uh, associate professor of voice will moderate a question and answer session with the audience. And then following the question and answer session, we'll also announce a winner. So there's a prize today. Uh, and we'll give, be giving away uh, one of our N150 books. And so the, the, the selection is random. Uh, you have to be here to win. So stay, stay with us until the end uh, in order to take your chance on the prize. Afterwards, we'll also have a reception next door and you'll have a chance to, to visit uh, with our speaker and with many of your colleagues and friends that are here today. So now, please welcome Chancellor Ronnie Green, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you very much, Bob. It is a pleasure to be here for our fourth N150 lecture, Nebraska lecture of the calendar year, as Bob said. Uh, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to do 12 of these during our 150th anniversary year celebration. And I just want to also call out, as Bob has just done, uh, thank you to Humanities Nebraska and the National Endowment for the Humanities that are helping us to actually facilitate this expansion of our lecture series uh, for the calendar year. We've had three wonderful lectures already this year. Uh, you might recall in January, Charlene Behrens, who I see sitting here uh, in the audience, gave us a wonderful overview of the history and the impact of our unicameral uh, legislature here uh, in Nebraska in February during Charter Week. 
Uh, we had a great lecture and kind of a, a VR even experience, if you will, um, about the architecture of the University of Nebraska and a, a special emphasis around University Hall in particular as the first building on our campus. And then, then last month, we had a great uh, delve into history with the Abbott sisters, uh, the social justice sisters, as you might remember John Sorensen's lecture uh, that we had just a few weeks ago. And today, we have a very special treat as our fourth lecturer, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce uh, it for you. Today, Tim Borstelman, the Ian and Catherine Thompson Professor of Modern World History, and an expert in the intersection of U.S. domestic history and international history is our Nebraska lecturer. And I also want to underline, before I tell you how wonderful Tim is, about what an honor it is to be selected to give these lectures. So Tim, congratulations on that, that honor and being selected. Though, though most of the lectures, as I've already described uh, in this series this year, are focused on university and state history, this, this particular presentation is not only a very timely one, but also is one that has a global reach. And its topic is particularly resonant in today's turbulent political environment. Today, Tim will explore the historical events that have shaped Americans' perceptions of immigrants, refugees, and people who live in other countries. He will examine why, despite resurging U.S. nativism in the past few years, most Americans still believe that those outside groups in their hearts aren't all that different from Americans in their perspectives and themselves. The themes of Tim's lecture will be including, included in his forthcoming book from Columbia University Press, The Hearts of Foreigners, How Americans Understand Others, that's due uh, to come out in publication in the spring of 2020. In addition to that book, Tim has authored or co-authored four others, including his first, Apartheid's Reluctant Uncle, the United States and Southern Africa in the Early Cold War. That work received the Stuart Burneth Prize of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations for the best first book in American dis diplomatic history. Tim is also a very highly regarded teacher and instructor here at the university and on our campus. He received the Annis Chaikin Sorensen Award for Outstanding Teaching in the Humanities here at UNL in 2015. He's also a four-time recipient of the UNL Parents Recognition Award, which honors individuals who have made a significant difference in students' lives, and a two-time winner of the People Who Inspire Award from UNL's Mortarboard chapter, a group of students who I think, as you know, are selected as a senior honorary for their academic um, and leadership excellence on our campus. Please join me in welcoming Tim, who will present today's lecture, The Hearts of Foreigners, How Americans Understand Others. Tim. With any luck, I'll only be mic'd once. Can you hear me in the back? I hope you can. Great, great. Thank you, Chancellor Green. It is, uh, it is an honor to be here, and I'm particularly grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here today um, to, to spend this time with us. Uh, it's great to be back as well in Nebraska because recently I have had the opportunity to talk about this book project um, in audi with audiences in different parts of the country, and, uh, which is fun, but it's great to come back and feel like I'm sort of with my home team again. Uh, especially several colleagues and friends who are here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, of course, that, that doesn't mean we're home fans. It means you're supposed to be tough referees. And remember that referees are tougher on the home team, right? Because they got to show that they're even-minded. So I will expect particularly difficult and challenging questions from you That's the, at the end. That's the other great thing about being back on your own campus. You can, you can sort of act professorial and people expect it. You know, you shall do this. <laughs> tough questions, that's the goal. Six years ago, I began serious research into a historical question that had long interested me. How have Americans thought about and understood non-Americans? Conceptions of foreigners have underpinned 
all of US foreign relations and all of US immigration policies, two fields of historical inquiry that have traditionally been studied separately, but that actually fit very closely together. I completed the bulk of this research in the first four of those six years, which coincided with the uh, second presidential term of Barack Obama, and I began writing up the results. It was an optimistic time for considering the question of foreignness and the expanding definition of who could be considered fully Americans. Historians, we may work on the past, but we are not immune from the world that we actually live in, despite what some of our spouses think. Then came a certain election two and a half years ago. The results were loudly applauded by, among others, the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, so-called white nationalists, isolationists, and nativists. My storyline of, uh, of a sort of expanding tolerance, if you will, of uh, diversity seemed imperiled by these events. As some of my more blunt friends put it, and some of them are here today, I want to emphasize, uh, aren't you just plain wrong? The answer, I believe, is no. My argument is not about the future, but it's about the past. The historical evidence up to 2016 remains the same. There has always been a struggle between forces of inclusion and forces of exclusion, between those emphasizing commonalities and those emphasizing differences. While the pendulum swung one way in 2016, it's not at all clear that the nation's future is now Trumpian. Chinese revolutionary Zhou Enlai was once asked what he thought of the French Revolution a century and a half earlier. Zhou famously replied, too soon to tell. It is surely too soon to tell the future direction of US politics. But regarding foreignness, there is a historical pattern to date that is too clear to ignore or to discount. And it is largely an encouraging one. This is my story for you today. Foreign, what does it mean? The English word foreign derives from the Latin for door and outside. That which is outside the door and thus not part of us and our household, whoever we are here on the inside of the door. It's close to the Italian adverb fuori, outside. And it's opposite of the Spanish adjective familiar, meaning family. Foreigners do not belong to the family. Or do they? Or could they? How have Americans understood the nature of other peoples over time? Are they essentially similar to Americans? Or are they, in their cultural or even biological essence, different? On the answer to this question has hung great significance for how the United States has interacted with the rest of the world. The most compelling answer to this question of how to understand foreigners, I want to suggest, was crystallized in a scene from Full Metal Jacket, Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film about a group of American GIs who were uh, serving in Vietnam. A US colonel in the film, this fellow in the poster, is instructing a skeptical young army journalist in his unit about the purpose of the American war in Southeast Asia. We are here to help the Vietnamese because inside every foreigner, the colonel uses a racial epithet for Asians, but he clearly means all foreigners. Inside every foreigner, there is an American trying to get out. This universalist assumption arises not merely in fiction or art, John Pryor, a US Army sergeant serving in Iraq two decades later, explained precisely the same view to journalist George Packer. In my heart, said Sergeant Pryor, in my heart, I believe everybody's American. Indeed, from the convention hall in Philadelphia in 1787 to the invasion route through southern Iraq in 2003, there has been an abiding assumption that American culture American principles and American practices are not only the best ever created by human beings, but are also closely aligned with the very essence of human nature. The ultimate logic of American exceptionalism on brightest display during the Cold War held that US history and American institutions had facilitated the full liberation of the human spirit and the fulfillment of the highest human aspirations. American democracy and American culture were thus seen as truly natural, 
in common American thinking, giving citizens self-rule, freedom, and a market economy that sold them what they wanted and what they needed. Such assumptions about the essential character of American society and about the inner yearnings of non-Americans reached unprecedented influence in the mid-20th century, but they were not entirely new in the Cold War. The revolutionaries of the 1770s had expected other peoples to emulate their actions. And in fact, they had watched as most of Latin America did so in the following generation. The subsequent story of US expansion awkwardly balanced conquest with attempts at conversion from Pequot and Cherokee to Afghani and Iraqi. A letter sent by the Continental Congress to the inhabitants of Quebec in 1774, perfectly squared the circle of an expanding empire imagining itself as a center of freedom. The Continental Congress's letter invited the Quebecois to join the anti-British Union of Colonial Troops marching north with these words, you will have been conquered into liberty if you act as you ought. While Quebec and the rest of Canada managed to avoid being conquered into liberty, others were not so fortunate or unfortunate, depending on one's political views. Through the 19th century, US dominion ranged from Liberia in the east to Hawaii and the Philippines in the west, from Alaska in the north to Nicaragua in the south, and of course, right here to Nebraska in the center of the continent. But certain constraints had to be overcome to enable the full flowering of American universalism. One such constraint had been persistent racial and ethnic prejudice that cramped the ability of white Americans to fully imagine non-Europeans and even many Europeans from east and south of the Alps as being like themselves. Another constraint was a lingering cultural insecurity among American elites. While intensely proud of US economic success, they still look to Europe for the highest cultural standards in such arenas as art or literature, or drama, fashion, cuisine. And a third constraint was the tradition of hemispheric, if not isolationist, resistance to global engagement and to militarism. The political and, and military position of the United States in international affairs remained modest before World War II in comparison to the nation's economic might. These constraints began to disappear rapidly in the 1940s as the distinctive circumstances of the mid 20th century ratcheted up the stakes for how Americans understood non-Americans. The denouement of World War II left millions of US military personnel on duty on every continent and on every ocean. The startling resurgence of the US economy expanded American trade interests everywhere. The, de the decline of globalism reshaped American politics. I'm sorry, the decline of colonialism reshaped global politics and the Cold War drew the American presence outwards toward the world. As Secretary of State Dean Acheson explained to a group of newspaper editors in 1950, there is no longer any difference between foreign questions and domestic questions. They are all part of the same question. In newly extensive and intensive contact with foreigners everywhere, Americans had to figure them out. What Americans did after 1945 was to largely shed some older hierarchical notions of humankind grounded particularly in ideas about race, ethnicity, and religion, and to confirm instead a growing sense of foreigners as potential Americans. Despite some ongoing dissent, the broad middle ground of common sense in mainstream American society came to agree eventually with the Colonel in Full Metal Jacket and with Sergeant John Pryor in Iraq that other peoples, despite often growing up and living under repressive political and religious regimes, still in their hearts, if they were allowed to, would re reveal themselves as American. They wanted, in other words, US style freedom, opportunity, and affluence. This view of foreigners was both profoundly ethnocentric and inward looking on the one hand, and universalistic and inclusive on the other. And it came to be shared across the political spectrum from liberal proponents of immigration reform to conservative advocates of preemptive war in Iraq and by most moderate Americans in between. 
Very few Americans believed in cultural relativism. If American culture was natural and allowed for the fullest expression of human freedom, and if other peoples aspired to live like Americans or even to be Americans, then what Americans most feared was the loss of their natural freedom to unnatural subversion. Captivity was the threat, and supposed communist brainwashing, mental captivity, emerged as the quintessential challenge of the Cold War era. While my primary theme today is the shrinking sphere of what was foreign to Americans, I want to emphasize also Americans' concomitant anxieties about possibly losing their freedoms to subversion and to captivity. And I will conclude today by suggesting the potent magnetism of relatively democratic American capitalist culture, whose individualistic pursuit of material comforts and personal freedoms may have been the actual greatest subversive force in late 20th century international history. Let us consider first the problem of Americanness. How did Americans, in the era of their greatest power and widest contacts with the outside world, the decades of World War II and right thereafter, how did they come to understand their own American identity? The very idea of foreignness, after all, required not just boundary lines with Canada and with Mexico, but also a clear sense of Americanness. Like most peoples, Americans tended to cherish a firm sense of who they were and to imagine other nations having similarly clear, timeless national essences. Thus, the stereotypes of Germans as orderly, Japanese as self-effacing, Italians as emotional, uh, British as stoic, and so on. Indeed, the very idea of entities called Germany or Japan or Italy or Britain seemed inherently logical with the nation state, if not liberal democracy, assumed as a kind of end of history. Americans paid much less attention to the implications of the continual process of human movement and migration across history. This was the biggest story of all, the two-step process of first human migration out of East Central Africa and all around the globe, creating the wide diversity of cultures, phenotypes, and languages, and second, globalization, or the reconnecting of the world's far-flung peoples since roughly 1500 AD after the Columbian voyages. In other words, people move. Human history is the story of continuous movement with perpetual cultural evolution and political change as a result. But most Americans by the mid 20th century imagined their own national borders as solid, permanent, and sanctioned by some degree of divine approval. On a map, the oceans provided the anchors and the relatively straight east-west lines just seemed, well, right. There were a few imperial complications around the edges. Hawaii and Alaska muddied the picture. The Philippines slipped off to at least formal independence in 1946. Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands seemed mostly just winter tourist destinations. And the Panama Canal Zone and Guantanamo Bay remained beyond most Americans' consciousness. And those straight lines west from El Paso and west from Lake of the Woods had, of course, little to do with natural dividing features such as rivers or mountains. But few US citizens had any doubts about their nation's geographical identity. Regional differences, however, complicated the meaning of Americanness well into the 20th century. The Civil War made vivid the absence of national unity, and the South remained an outlier in American life for generations thereafter. Various parts of the nation claim to be uniquely emblematic of American identity. Massachusetts, for example, boasted the pilgrims and the bulk of the nation's early Christian missionaries going off to bring the light of the gospel to such unchurched regions as Texas, not an aspect of history much noted in the Lone Star State, where regional pride has long held Texas to embody the very essence of American character, except when the governor is publicly contemplating secession. Philadelphians, for their part, touted the Liberty Bell and the writing of the Constitution, though uh, French revolutionaries in 1793, before beheading King uh, Louis XVI, apparently considered instead simply exiling him to Philadelphia as sufficiently cruel punishment. 
There's apologies to anybody who's a native of the city of brotherly love. But Midwesterners, meanwhile, like to call their region the nation's heartland, and Nebraska, perhaps, the very heart of the heartland. Westerners claimed their landscapes as the most American of all, with Alaskans promoting the last frontier and Montanans proclaiming the last best place. New York remained the most famous and most diverse place in the country, perhaps both the most loved and the most hated. With an immigrant-filled population of 75 million in 1900 and 300 million in 2000, the United States did not lend itself to simple characterization. Despite its size and its persistent heterogeneity, however, the United States did emerge from the 1920s, the 1930s, and World War II with a new and increasingly robust sense of national unity. Fighting and winning two global wars stimulated national self-consciousness and social consolidation, as did the emergence of more tightly integrated national markets and national media, particularly radio and film. Observers at home and abroad, even before World War II, had begun to comment on two new aspects of American identity. First, an American way of life as the first truly modern nation built on individual economic opportunity and mass liberal democracy. And second, a Judeo-Christian tradition of religious liberty relatively free from prejudice. That's a term that doesn't show up before the 1930s. Revived by wartime uh, economic expansion and by victory over right-wing totalitarianism, the United States set off into the post-war era, determined at home to build a middle-class society of unprecedented affluence and abroad to lead what Americans called the free world against the new threat of left-wing totalitarianism. American leaders in the Cold War imagined other peoples as eager to live like Americans. When President Harry Truman in 1947 famously bisected the globe's enormous diversity into what he called just two alternative ways of life, echoing the biblical division of goats from sheep, he articulated the commonsensical American assumption that no people would knowingly choose communist enslavement over democratic capitalist freedom. All people desired freedom, only despots kept them in chains. So the United States was not opposed to other peoples, but only to oppressive regimes. Other peoples identified with the United States, with both the American citizenry and the US government. President Woodrow Wilson had placed this assumption front and center in the first US engagement in a global war. We have no quarrel with the German people. Wilson declared in 1917, we have no feeling toward them but one of sympathy and friendship. The enemy, Wilson said, was solely the Prussian autocracy. 20 years later, most Americans were inclined to see the German people themselves as the first victims of the Nazi gangsters. Late in World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt continued to insist that we bring no charge against the German race but only against the Nazi conspirators. In the midst of the nuclear missile crisis in Cuba in 1962, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, he's the fellow on the right here, yes, uh, said precisely the same thing. The United States had no quarrel with the Cuban people, only with the regime that has fastened itself upon that country. The US Congress and President Dwight Eisenhower in 1959 issued the first annual Captive Nations Declaration to highlight the injustice of peoples kept unfree uh, in Eastern Europe. Even after the Cold War, the 2003 US invasion of Iraq and the overthrow of its government proceeded on the promise of Vice President Richard Cheney that we will in fact be greeted as liberators. This was a liberal, universalistic vision of American culture and government as optimal for everyone. This was not a conservative Edmund Burke style understanding of societies as organic, coherent, and fundamentally different from one another. Regardless of their views of invading other nations or their self-descriptions as conservative or liberal or moderate, Americans during the Cold War tended to assume that other peoples were, for the most part, like Americans. Indeed, others often apparently wanted to be Americans 
as the United States had received well over half of the vast flow of Europeans who left their continent of origin in the century following 1820, what historian Alfred Crosby called the Caucasian tsunami of some 50 million people. The 1924 law establishing the national origin system for immigration largely closed off this flow into the US, reflecting the enduring power of nativist sentiment in US political life. But the geopolitical imperatives of World War II soon sprang leaks in that restrictionist dam, and the Cold War competition for good relations with the newly independent nations of the Third World swept the dam away eventually. American soldiers, for example, brought home tens of thousands of brides from England, France, Italy, Germany, and eventually Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam. The Hart Cellar Immigration Act of 1965 eliminated the national origin system. Invidious ethnic and racial distinctions retreated. Not disappeared, but retreated, particularly in public life. A once essentially black and white society became rapidly more multiracial. Together, Latinos and people of Asian heritage constituted 5.5% of the US population in 1970. By 2017, they had more than quadrupled to 24%. Increasingly, in the last third of the 20th century, foreigners from all lands could become Americans. Now, racially coded anti-immigrant sentiments hardly disappeared from American life, as remains all too evident today. The anti-immigrant tradition is long and powerful stretching back to the era of Benjamin Franklin's warning that colonial Pennsylvania was becoming a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. But just as the idea of Germans having a different complexion from other Northwestern European Americans came to seem peculiar, so too did mainstream public attitudes about race and discrimination change dramatically in the decades following the black freedom struggle and the decolonization of Asia and Africa. Perhaps even more striking in the high Cold War years was the transformation of mainstream American attitudes and behaviors regarding religious diversity. The United States had long been a more avowedly religious nation than other Western industrialized countries, even if its people's religious knowledge did not always keep pace with their professed piety. One thinks, for example, of the recent poll indicating that fewer than one third of Americans know that Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount, or that 10% of Americans believe Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. For, this was fun, putting that slide together. I enjoyed that. For more than three centuries before World War II, uh, and despite a constitutional emphasis on religious liberty, the nation's large Protestant majority had regarded Roman Catholics and Jews with tolerance at best, with skepticism at almost all times, and with often violent disdain at countless moments. But in the face of what we're seeing as deeply anti-religious totalitarian enemies, first Nazi Germany and then the Soviet Union, religious differences among Americans swiftly lost their motivating power. In their place emerged a newly public tri-faith culture under the banner of that still fresh term, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Mainstream American understanding of what was foreign in terms of religion, a key American concern, shrank dramatically. Anti-Catholicism had previously served as a, a rich seam in the mine of American, the American past. For the Protestant majority, the Church of Rome tended to embody the warping of religious truth, the practice of magic, and the sway of blind loyalty to authority over individual reason and conscience. Then came the large new numbers of Catholics in the immigrant surge of the three decades before World War II, before World War I, many of them coming here to Nebraska. Their increasing assimilation in the post-1924 uh, restrictionist era, Catholic soldiers' patriotic service in World War II, the fervent anti-communism of prominent Roman Catholics during the Cold War, and the election of John Kennedy to the White House in 1960. By the 1970s, even fundamentalist Protestants, traditionally the nation's fiercest anti-Catholics, 
were finding common ground with conservative Catholics in the new Christian right. By 2009, the US Supreme Court consisted of six Catholic justices and three Jewish justices, not a single Protestant among them. One of the largest stories of modern US history is the change in perception of Roman Catholics from being essentially foreign to being quintessentially American. Anti-Semitism followed a similar path. An influx of Jewish immigrants in the years before World War I stimulated traditional Christian prejudice and discrimination, which actually only crested late in World War II. Then came a series of blows to that ugly tradition. The patriotic service of Jewish Americans in the US military, the full revelations of the Holocaust, the Cold War imperative of equality and inclusion, and the creation of the modern state of Israel. The success of Israel, in particular, recast Jews in the minds of Gentile Americans as no longer helpless victims of the Nazis, but now tough, virile pioneers making the desert bloom as successful farmers despite hostility from non-European indigenous neighbors, a story that sounded to American ears a lot like the story of the United States and a lot like Nebraska in particular. Discrimination against Jews in the United States, while not disappearing, declined rapidly in the decades after 1945. It's measurable from outmarriage rates to university admissions processes to employment opportunities. The new Christian right, for their part, became fierce defenders of Israel and Israelis and Americans developed myriad intimate ties. By 1996, Israel's then new prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, sounded and acted precisely like an American because he had lived extensively in the United States where he had attended high school and college and had begun his career. Foreigners, it turned out, often didn't remain foreign. Former external enemies, Germany, Japan, Italy became close allies. Once suspect internal exotics, Roman Catholics, Jews, Latinos, became mainstream Americans. A defining feature of modern American society has been the tendency to absorb diversity and even dissent in a resilient, expansive, popular culture. Americans would subvert the subversives, even the communists, eventually. The dream of a better socialist future was the siren song that most Americans feared above all others. For capitalists, socialism posed a perilous form of apostasy, a false promise of even greater freedom and justice. For religious believers, Marxism offered only scorn. And for vigorous nationalists, communism was about as foreign as one could get, with the aim of uniting all workers of the world and thereby erasing the very national boundaries that literally defined America as America. To a people obsessed with individual liberty, communist rule threatened captivity. Eastern Europeans and North Koreans had joined Soviet peoples in this kind of captivity by 1948. And a year later, the establishment of the People's Republic of China dismayed Americans who had long believed their country had a special role to play in the, na in the world's largest nation through missionary and educational work. With God's help, our own Senator Kenneth Weary of Nebraska had declared just a few years earlier, with God's help, the United States could lift up Shanghai up and up, ever up, until it looks just like Kansas City. Instead, young men from Kansas City and young men from Shanghai were soon killing each other by the thousands on the Korean Peninsula. Similarly, Fidel Castro's revolution in Cuba in 1959 seemed to most Americans another demonstration of free people being taken captive and enslaved, now worrisomely close to American shores. Four years later, the high priest of socialism himself, Nikita Khrushchev, visited the starkest symbol of communist captivity, the newly erected Berlin Wall, and announced to an East German crowd of half a million, I love the wall. For Americans who thought of their own culture as the freest and highest expression of human nature, the idea of captivity was peculiarly repugnant. Physical captivity, such as being taken prisoner in war, was bad enough. But the prospect of mental captivity, of Americans losing their minds to the false lures of apostasy, this was simply evil. It was unnatural. 
fears of captivity dated back to the earliest English settlers in North America and their encounters with indigenous peoples, the original subversive communitarian reds, if you will, which gave rise to abiding anxieties about white captives going native in the phrase that was commonly used. That is, losing who they really were. The central story of captivity in the United States was, of course, that of tens of millions of enslaved black workers, a century-long gulag whose deep scars remain visible today. But for the vast majority of Americans by the 1940s, who were not black and who did not live in the South, race slavery seemed increasingly a story of a, a distant past, even as segregation remained. Meanwhile, the 20th century had witnessed the rise of these two great totalitarian empires that literally locked up their own people and other peoples, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia. Anne O'Hare McCormick wrote in the New York Times in 1952 of this grim century of the homeless man in which Russians and Eastern Europeans were now the saddest people on earth forced against their wills to live under a system so alien to their own instincts and desires. Their own instincts and desires, in this view, were to live freely, like Americans, or at least like white Americans. The spread of this system so alien into China in 1949 filled many Americans with dread. Communism had now seized the most populous nation in the world, a symbol of the non-white global majority who were rapidly shedding colonialism. It seemed a portent of the future, particularly when the United States and China went to war with each other within a year in Korea. And when American soldiers began to be taken as prisoners of war, a new fear swept through the US military command and through the American public, the fear of brainwashing. This term encapsulated American anxieties that the communists in China had developed devious new methods of psychological torture and mind control, used first on Chinese citizens and then on American POWs, which supposedly enabled them to reprogram the minds of their victims. The Wall Street Journal explained this phenomenon in an editorial under this expository headline, The Silent People. Communist brainwash the once individualistic Chinese into gloomy conformity, fear, and mental atrophy. Despite a lack of scientific evidence, acknowledged a few years later by the US Army, brainwashing became the standard explanation for the refusal of 21 American POWs to be repatriated after the war. They, they chose to go to China instead. By contrast, the 50,000 Chinese and North Korean POWs who also refused repatriation, remaining instead in US-allied South Korea or being sent to US-allied Taiwan, they seem to represent to Americans a vigorous confirmation of the natural aspiration of all peoples to live freely like Americans. The myth of brainwashing outlived the Korean War and drifted into many corners of, of Cold War American culture, from the novel and film The Manchurian Candidate down to today's uh, te Showtime television series Homeland. Brainwashing dominated the science fiction films that proved so popular in the 1950s, in which aliens regularly infiltrated and changed American minds while leaving them apparently normal and unchanged on the surface. Suddenly, while you're asleep, warned the 1956 film Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They will absorb your minds, your memories, and you'll be reborn into an untroubled world of collectivist calm without individuality or meaning. Such concerns about preserving Americans' individuality and essential personhood dovetailed precisely with the dramatic expansion of psychology as an academic discipline after World War II. I wouldn't be here without it, in fact, since my father was a university psychologist in the years right after World War II. Glad it expanded. <laughs> in the long run, however, in the long run, even supposedly brainwashing communists could not remain completely foreign to Americans. From the beginning in 1917, of course, some Americans had been sympathetic to the Bolshevik project. And even those highly unsympathetic sometimes learned to live with it, often quite profitably. The Ford Motor Company, for example, in the 1920s, who sold a, a very significant percentage of their tractors to Moscow. US leaders promoted warmly positive views of the Soviet Union during the crucial World War II alliance against the Axis powers. 
The United States built a constructive relationship with the communist government of Yugoslavia after Yugoslavia's ejection from the Soviet bloc in 1948. Even the iciest U.S. relationship with the communist regime began to thaw in 1972 when President Richard Nixon famously visited the People's Republic of China and six years later, Beijing initiated reforms allowing in the first subversive elements of private enterprise, the Trojan horse of free markets, if you will. I was going to have a slide of various Trojan horses, but none of the imagery was very good. You get the idea of the, you know, coming out of the horse. The United States even eventually opened formal diplomatic relations with communist Vietnam in 1995, establishing a new relationship that would warm very rapidly. Indeed, within a few months, the new Vietnamese ambassador to Washington found himself invited to dinner with the most obdurate and powerful American anti-communist and long-term racial segregationist, Jesse Helms, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Helms represented North Carolina's tobacco farmers who were facing declining domestic smoking rates at the time and negative publicity at home and were seeking to make gains in more tobacco-friendly markets abroad, particularly in Asia. Helms was pleased with the dinner and later explained to reporters I was with some Vietnamese recently, and some of them were smoking two cigarettes at the same time. Now that's my kind of customers. <laughs> Perhaps the largest change of all in mainstream 20th century American understandings of what was foreign regarded Asians and people from Asia. From a demonized and supposedly unassimilable yellow peril, People of Asian descent in the United States rose swiftly during the Cold War to emerge as a so-called model minority by the 1960s. John Dower and other scholars have made clear that non-Asian Americans long held a wide variety of images and ideas about Asians, many of them fiercely negative, but also some that were quite positive. The US wars against Japan and, and in Korea and in Vietnam sharpened the sense of racially coded enmity, but in each case they also complicated it with the presence of critically important Asian allies of Americans. Returning US soldiers also brought home brides in many cases, first a few thousand from Japan and then almost 100,000 from South Korea by the end of the century. These women joined skilled Chinese refugees from the communist revolution adopted South Korean orphans, and highly decorated Japanese-American veterans of World War II, as well as Issei Gold Star mothers, as faces of a new Pacific-oriented Americanness. California voters sent the first Asian-American to Congress in 1956, and Hawaii, with its majority Asian-descended population, entered the Union as the 50th state in 1959. Reader's Digest, then an extremely popular magazine, noted what it called an amazing turnabout of Japanese Americans just one decade out from mass wartime incarceration, now enjoying a prestige, a prosperity, and a freedom from prejudice that even the most sanguine of them had never hoped to attain within their own lifetime. The process of domesticating Asianness into Americanness is an ongoing one not yet completed, despite the optimism of Reader's Digest and others. Discrimination against people of Asian background comes in many forms, from street violence to higher standards for elite college admissions. The very idea of a model minority was constructed in part as a not so subtle rebuke to African Americans during a time of militant protest against racial discrimination. Chinatown, in other words, was not Watts in historian Ellen Wu's concise formulation. The model minority idea necessarily carried its own burden of prejudicial limits, expectations of being studious, of being orderly, of being hardworking, of being deferential. But the old issue of whether Chinese Americans or Japanese Americans were really just extensions of China or Japan, as though their culture were carried somatically and inerasably in their skin, or in their bones, or even in their blood. This old issue had been decided in mainstream American life by the middle years of the Cold War. Vietnamese were reminded of this reality in 2009 when the USS Lawson docked in Da Nang for an official visit. 
And the American commander walked down the gangway to a red carpet welcome. He was H.B. Lee, once a five-year-old refugee from Vietnam back in 1975, and now the first Vietnamese American to command a U.S. Navy destroyer. The Chinese public demonstrated a similar awareness of changes in American life with the enormous attention they paid to the arrival in 2011 of Gary Locke as the first US ambassador to China of Chinese descent. During his two and a half years in Beijing, however, Locke failed to adequately curry favor with privileged Chinese officials. And major Chinese state media eventually responded to his imminent departure by referring to Ambassador Locke with a racial slur as a rotten banana. When a banana sits out for long, its yellow peels will always rot, revealing its inner white core. Thus did the government of the largest nation with an emigrant rather than immigrant tradition reveal its incomprehension of the integrating and hybrid character of what Cullen Murphy has called the world's most successful multi-ethnic state the United States. Across the last uh, several globalizing decades, the contours of what was considered foreign in American life shrank steadily due to sharply increased trade, information flows, cultural exchange, travel, and migration. In matters from food, music, and sports to disease, scientific education, and climate change, Americans became more engaged than ever before with non-Americans, a development eased by the rapid spread of English as a global language. Increased contact did not always lead, of course, to perfect understanding or even to good relations. Resistance to American-inflected globalization helped shape politics from Russia to China to the Middle East to Latin America. Thoughtful Americans worried about manifestations of anti-American sentiment abroad well before the September 11th attacks of 2001. And polls regularly revealed a wide gulf between Americans and informed knowledge of the non-American world. One example among many would be the Roper poll of late 2002 on the eve of the US invasion of Iraq, which revealed that only one in seven young Americans aged 18 to 24 that is, only 13% 13, 13 of them could even locate Iraq on a map, although Gary Trudeau in his cartoon strip Doonesbury responded that unfortunately for Saddam Hussein, all 13% are Marines. <laughs> Widespread American ignorance of the outside world was perhaps no worse than parochialism in any other country, but it had greater impact due to the scale and the intensity of American involvement beyond US borders. The argument here, in sum, is neither Whiggish nor Pollyanna-ish. My argument is simply this, that across the 20th century, and particularly over the Cold War decades, the United States engaged increasingly with foreign peoples in and from every part of the globe. And those interactions significantly spurred the expanding definition in mainstream American society of who could be considered fully American in legal terms and also in terms of politics and popular culture. That is in the common sense of mainstream American life. The radically more inclusive public society in which Americans lived by the early 21st century compared to the early 20th century stemmed in large part from the imperatives of the nation's foreign relations. Perhaps the greatest advantage that the United States has in engaging with foreigners in this era was its relentlessly absorptive popular culture and economy. American society operated much like an amoeba does with foreign objects. I wanted to come up with a little video clip of an amoeba in action, but failed, I'm sorry, but go with me here. It's, it's, after an initial encounter, an amoeba slowly surrounds and absorbs the foreign. What used to be outside becomes inside. This process happened with the United States, with cuisine and the continual evolution of popular taste to absorb new ethnic traditions. The same process was visible with the commodification of the counterculture, turning once exotic foreign seeming items such as rock and roll records or incense and now marijuana in many states into profitable mainstream consumer items. So too with once feared black political radicals such as Paul Robeson, 
and Malcolm X, each long since granted his own first class US postage stamp with a warm smiling image. The United States, the Indian American novelist Jhumpa Lahiri has suggested, just absorbs everything. It accommodates differences but always extinguishes them in some way. Immigrant parents, in particular, experience the power of this force on their children with varying mixtures of regret, resignation, and satisfaction. And they understand that that power better than do anxious nativists and better than do observers, including historians, who focus too narrowly on the sound and fury of those nativists. American culture is the amoeba culture. I grew up in North, America, North Carolina in the 1960s where political leaders scored a lot of points by warning of the supposed threats of subversion that came from communists and from racial integrationists, from homosexuals, from hippies, from insubordinate women, and the like. I spent much of my youth trying to grasp the full range of the ignorance and ill will of powerful people like Jesse Helms, my former senator, elected five times, served 30 years in the US Senate, only, only ended by his own resignation eventually. If there was a subversive, they were wrong, these, these people, like Helms. They were wrong about a lot of things. They were certainly wrong about subversion. If there was a subversive force loose in the world, it came rather from America's own democratic ideals, combined with America's own popular culture and seemingly infinite consumer pleasures. That culture and its products encouraged the spread of the viruses of individualism and headlong material consumption, which tended to disrupt other more traditional cultures. What is the process of civilizing? Prominent clergyman Josiah Strong famously asked in 1885, what is the process of civilizing but the creating of more and higher wants? And Americans have been at the front edge of this process of civilizing ever since. A wide swath of Americans may have imagined themselves to be what they called conservatives, but their way of life brought persistent pressure for change everywhere it flowed. There was nothing conservative about it. Americans instead turned out to be the real subversives of the modern world, determined at home and abroad that other peoples would, if given the chance, choose to live just like them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Borstelman for an excellent performance and, well, performance, I'm a singer, for an excellent lecture today. Thank you so much. Sure. And I think now all of our online friends can hear me speak. So at this time, we will entertain questions from our lecturer. And we do have someone out in the audience. If you would please wait until you are presented with a microphone to ask your question so our live stream friends can hear us as well. Who would like to speak first? Great, great job, Tim. Um, my question to you is, given what we are all experiencing today in relationship to foreigners, what period in time is most like this period, and how did we get through it then? You did ask for the hard questions. That's, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I asked for this. You did. That's really a mistake. Uh, next? No. <laughs> um, uh, hmm. Well, uh, one way to think about it is in terms of immigration restriction and when those major changes happened in the American legal system. And you know, there wasn't immigration restriction in this country before 1882 in any significant way. So in a certain sense, I guess you could almost say, any time before 1882. I mean, there was this, because the, the United States as a, as a political and economic project was, was one of building a society which had, thanks to the genocide of Native Americans, uh, a, a vast amount of land without enough labor to do the work that could be done on it. And so, you know, there's the filling in of the nation 
necessary in economic terms. But you could also see that in another period of economic, I mean, I'm sorry, of political change regarding immigration laws right in the middle of World War II, and that's in 1943 when the Chinese, uh, when the act is passed by Congress to allow in a, a, a sort of symbolic 105 individuals from China as uh, into the United States for naturalization. That is to say, this ends the period of 60 some years in which uh, China had been uh, identified as the only nation ever singly, singled out to be the one place that people could not move from to the United States in order to become Americans. It was sort of this, this unique sort of badge. It was like the, the Scarlet A, I suppose, depending on your literary references. The thing you couldn't do you to be, was to be a Chinese immigrant. And that's ended in 1943. And people like to point out, well, it's not exactly out of the goodness of the hearts of Americans that that's done. It's done because of the US need for China as a critical ally against the, in the war against Japan, where the Chinese are holding down uh, some 2 million Japanese soldiers on the occupied eastern coast of, of China, which who were therefore not out helping kill Americans in the island hopping campaigns coming across the Pacific. But in fact, it's more than that. You can see lots of sympathy for Chinese peoples in popular cultural references in the 19, early 1940s during the war because China is seen as an ally uh, of the United States. You have this sort of um, sense, and I mentioned this in my talk, in which the sort of the, the contrasting images, negative and positive, of Asians, you see the positive ones come back up for China in the course of the 1930s as Japan's power rises. And instead, um, you see by the early 1940s, you know, that the Chinese are seen as these terribly important allies. So that's a pretty cool precedent, I guess. I guess I, I'd go probably with that one. I think you could also say after 1965 uh, that the, the, the Immigration Act, uh, the Hart Seller Act, which eliminates the old national origin system, is a, is a freeing, it's not, it's not perfect, it's complex, and it limits the number of uh, immigrants from the Western Hemisphere. So it's the first time that Latinos, people from south of the border, had, uh, Latin Americans, had been able to come to the United States and have those numbers limited. But in other ways, the Hart Seller Act is really important because it eliminates the old racially defined system of uh, immigration restriction. And the late 60s, you see very little of the sort of anxiety about uh, immigrants. Of course, that's gonna change as the numbers get bigger by the 80s. I'd go with the early 1940s. Is that it for the hard questions? I don't Can know whether there are any other hard too? questions. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Thank you for the talk. I yeah. really liked it. I, one of the things that strikes me about it is, is kind of the parallelism with anti-Americanism in that the fears of anti-Americanists are in some ways the same amo, 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 amoeba, amoeba, I don't know. Amoeba like qualities of 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 kind of this American creed, right? That um, American consumerism and American individualism just kind of takes over and, and becomes popular. But I think particularly in the sixties, there's also this this critique that right that what you get is not democracy but consumerism, and kind of the fake choices and freedoms of consumerism without the actually real freedom uh, and political freedom. Um, and if, I feel like in some ways those fears may be even more prevalent now when you see kind of a, 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 a state like China where consumerism yeah. is all there, but the political freedom isn't going coming along with it, and then yeah. the kind of regression that you maybe see some, to some degree in the West. So, yeah, kind of a common question. Yeah. Great. So, so can I just point out that if, if distinguished colleagues from my own department, like Alex Pazansky, are going to be allowed to ask questions, this is going to go downhill very fast. Because that's <laughs> a brilliant and terribly important observation is that the exporting of American-style you know, consumerism and democracy is often weighted to consumerism. No question about that. And China is, is running an amazingly uh, volatile experiment in this right now, in these decades. The one, the one thing I guess I would say about that is that uh, we're in the middle of it, right? And so we can't tell. I mean, the, uh, the, the anxiety in China has been always that this economic, um, the growth of a of private enterprise, of private property ownership and entrepreneurship within China, which has, in some ways, you can understand it as the largest and most successful anti-poverty program in global history, that is bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty into something closer to a secure, economically secure life. It, it, the anxiety in Beijing has always been that this, we need to give them these advances economically in order to keep controlling them politically, to maintain our own dominance as the Communist Party uh, controlling the country. And their concern has always been, would this get out of hand? Would this go too far? And you can see the ferocious repression of dissent inside the Chinese system 
these days, especially under Xi, and even a little bit before Xi Jinping was, uh, became head of state there. Uh, and so uh, that anxiety is still there, even as Americans are fascinated by Chinese effectiveness in crushing dissent while accommodating economic growth. But you know, we don't know what it's gonna look like 10 years from now, right? We're, just like Americans are fascinated by, by supposed Russian military might, you know, which is an amazingly short-sighted understanding of how desperately weakened the Russian political economy is, which isn't to say they don't create all kinds of problems and challenges for the United States and, and everyone else, particularly Ukrainians and anybody else on their border. Um, but it, it, we have a tendency to be too concerned about that. I'm not saying that China's not an issue of concern, but I'm not sure where we'll be 20 years from now. I mean, there may be a time when they're writing the history of modern China that looks back and says, oh, we made a boo-boo in Xinjiang. You know, we went too far crushing the Uyghurs or something in that. We don't know. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're going to sail on and have a permanent totalitarian system politically, even as with the economic, yeah. But how democracy and consumerism fit together, that's, I hope you're going to write the book on that one, because that's a, that's a big question. And Americans these days, you know, we don't bother going to the ballot box very much, right? Our levels of democratic participation, even in voting, much less other political forms of participation, is so minimal. But boy, do we show up. I was going to say we show up at the mall, but we don't anymore now. We just show up in the Amazon box clicking, you know. But we still show up there, right? I mean, so, so yeah, that, how we do that, well, that's a tough question. Thanks. Yeah. I think there was another question. In Tim, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you a question about, um, so about immigration and foreignness, but thinking about American citizenship and American laws and whiteness. So even when foreigners are coming into the United States, it's not clear, as people who would be defined as foreigners, that they're entitled to citizenship. And so if you can kind of think about that um, and tell me how, how you see that as relating particularly to the anti-immigration laws. Um, so even if you're here, who can be citizens and what does that say about our understandings of foreigners? And then the second question, which is related, <laughs> okay. he knows me, so it's okay. Um, black people as being seen as perpetually foreign, mm -hmm. even though they were born here for generations. So that's my questions. Yeah. Thank you. Oof. Is that it? Can we boycott the history department from now on? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, to the first one, uh, uh, the 19th century and the early 20th century is spent in to no small extent sorting out whether all Europeans are considered white or not, you know, whether they have sort of full citizenship or not. Um, legally they do, but it has to be worked out as to exactly where Europe begins and ends, you know, when you're out in Russia or when you're out in, in Syria or, you know, I mean, the Caucasus is a great example because the 1917 division of the world by the U.S. Uh, authorities regarding banning Asians runs a line right through the Caucasus, which is amusing if you think about it because, of course, Caucasians are supposed to be from there, right? But it turns out that northern Caucasus inhabitants qualify as potential migrant immigrants, whereas southern Caucasian inhabitants don't, you know, so, so they can be Caucasian maybe, but they can't be white, which is, it's really, it's kind of fun. So some of the, in other words, the sort of absurdities eventually work themselves out into what is now our common sense about what whiteness means, which is absurd in a whole other set of ways. Um, and it, it's based on the social construction of race, as we like to say in the university. Uh, so citizenship, I, I mean, the other way to say this is that citizenship was largely managed by states before, you know, before the 14th Amendment. Um, and when birthright citizenship is really established in a clear way um, in 1868. So uh, citizenship is being worked out. I think that's a good point. And part of what I'm trying to do is suggest a kind of mainstream here of Amer American thinking about that, that involves the law but goes much further than the law. And so I particularly appreciate that question because Irish are certainly not considered full-blown Americans in the 1850s in the way that they, some of them wind up going to California to work, to work and then to also work in anti-Chinese exclusionist political campaigns to establish particularly their, their Americanness by showing that they're, that they're not Chinese, right? And then the bigger one, your second question, is the perpetual foreignness of being of African descent in the United States. You know, and that the whole project of whiteness is, much, is partly about not being Asian in California, but it's always about not being of African descent. That's the, the key definition in order to have status 
outside of slavery to be, have free status and then later to have status in the segregated system of Jim Crow and the versions of mainstream harassment and social uh, uh, lack of privilege that continues today even when we've legalized the system. You know, um, so that's a great question about, I mean, in a sense, what I do in the first chapter is, I try to think I do it elegantly, but I don't think so for the book. I try to say, look, there's this vast problem of blackness in American life. And I've spent the first half of my career writing about that, mostly. <laughs> and I'm saying, go check out this literature. It's crucial. It's cru but, but it's also, the, imagine, Americans no longer imagine, Americans of any race, imagine black Americans as not American in the mainstream of American culture by 1945. They're, they're often seen in lesser status. It's not that the, everybody's equal, but they're definitely not seen as foreign. Um, so that's a partial answer to great questions. Yeah, thanks. Same row. Yes. I, I've oh, got, God, here they go again. <laughs> three in a row. I'm, I'm also one of Tim's colleagues, and I'm also trying to subvert him and undermine him <laughs> as much as I possibly can. Be, Brainwash because, me. Because even. we love yes. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you used the phrase other peoples two or three times, I believe. And I was reminded once when I was in Germany and I went into an Italian restaurant and I got into a little conversation with the owner server. And he quickly explained to me that he wasn't Italian and this wasn't an Italian restaurant. He was Sicilian and this was a Sicilian restaurant and he really meant it. This was not pedanticism, mm -hmm. this was accuracy because Nobody in the Italian peninsula considers themselves to be Italian. They are Roman or Neapolitanese or they're European. But nobody wants to be Italian and is Italian. And I would want to put out there for you to chew on. I don't know if this is exactly a question, but the hearts of lots of foreigners are not really national in orientation. They're very much tribal and regional. I mean, for example, just to shift emphasis, who are the Chinese? I mean, they're the Han who came from Northeast Asia and have gradually taken over every place on the East Asian continent, all the way down to Tibet and out to, out to the West. And um, so to say that there are really Chinese is a little bit of a kind of fast move on the part of certain people. Uh, in Germany, for example, you know, if you're from Berlin, that's a long way from Munich and vice versa, and it's widespread. So, I mean, if you compare it with the United States, where it seems to me, I hope you'll agree, that we're terrific at integration. Yes, we've had some great failures in regards to black-white and, and in other ways, but, um, you know, the, most of the world out there belongs to a tribe or a region, and, and their hearts are local, unlike our hearts, which are kind of national or m very much moving in the national direction. So I'll stop there. Who? Okay. This is a terrific question and explosive in so many directions. I'm, I'm challenged about where to start. Let's do a couple of them that come to mind very quickly, though. One is the Italian case is brilliant because uh, Italians only learned when they came to migrants from the Ita peninsula we call Italy today only learned that they were Italian upon arriving in American, on American shores or other shores where they were lumped together with other peoples from the same peninsula or, in the case of Sicilians, the adjacent island, if an island can be adjacent. In other words, it, the whole thing is a, an artificial construction of Italianness. Um, there is some common ground in terms of legibility of language between Sicily and the Piedmont. Uh, it's not perfect, but, you know, I mean, so there is some sense in which Italian is spoken across the nation. I would give, I would grant that a few more, or argue that a few more Italians actually think of themselves as Italy than as Italian than you might be suggesting here. But there's definitely this long project of, of how do we figure out modern nations and how they come together. The United States is not unique in this regard. Um, I mean, you know, certainly um, the French have a very clear idea of what Frenchness is, you know, the Germans the same, et cetera, but it's been constructed over time. And what I really, what it makes, your question makes me think of is how you can think of history as, as flowing in a sort of way, in a sort of movie sense or a film sense, as flowing continuously, and we're artificially stopping at any point to say, boop, at this point, these are the Chinese. Whereas 200 years later, it doesn't look like that. And so, but we act as though it's permanent. We act as though these have these national essences to them. And boy, is that not true. And so I take that point as being particularly important. The United States had its own version, of course, with the Civil War, which, you know, 
give or take a few things, you know, we might have been in a whole different era of two different nations, and you know, who knows how all that whole history would have flowed out as a contingency from that. So, yeah, the American nation uh, is powerfully assembled. It is, um, it is admired widely or worried about widely, depending on the politics of the observer from outside, about its multi-ethnicity. The fact that the US is so diverse fascinates people. It's by far the most diverse of the large powers of the great nations. Uh, about 42, 43 million people in the United States today were born elsewhere, um, which is more than four times as large as the next largest immigrant, foreign-born population in any other country. Partly that's because the US is big. It's the third largest country in population, so it's going to have more foreigners. As a percentage, our, our percentage is not as big as Canada and a few other places. But in sheer numbers, it's vast, the American story. And other countries tend to be intrigued by this. I mean, if you were Hitler, you looked at it and you thought, oh, it's a mongrel nation, and they'll never do well in warfare because they aren't unified. So, you know. But if you're you know, more of an of a opposite perspective, you, people look at the United States and thought the election of Barack Obama, which fascinated people across the world. They were like, how can they do that? These Americans, it's amazing. How can they elect a black person and then re-elect him? It, it, it was just stunning. And you saw all these reports of people from France and Germany and other places saying, God, we could never do that. You know, and so the American model is different that way for all its ferocious continuing patterns of nativist waves, resurgent anti-immigrant stuff, and the continued racism under it. You know, it's, a, it's this continual struggle. And the most of what I'm trying to do in this talk and in the book is to remind people that there's a context, a historical context, in which the baseline of degree of inclusion is not what it used to be, that it's gotten higher, much higher than it used to be, which doesn't mean that we now say, oh, great, it's all done, perfect. I mean, hardly. In some ways, you, it's, it's that very success over time in being more inclusive that enables people to have a high enough standard to think, why are we stopping now? Why are we harassing trans people? You know, or whatever the next you know, issue of concern. Why, is, why are we still dealing with nativist feelings in the United States that erupt in violence? I mean, how, so, so that consciousness, to me, can be considered a sign of success, but not of complacency. I mean, the response to that isn't, you don't say, okay, we got it figured out. We keep carrying on. Great questions. We, that's the whole history department right there. You see why these people, they're wonderful. Let's My go. colleagues, I love them. Right there. Let's, okay, yes. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Thank you yeah. for such a rich conversation. <laughs> so I would love for you to give us your take on the Latino question. Yeah. Just whatever you want to riff on, uh -huh. spin it out for us. How, how do Latinos fit into this conversation? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> how do Latinos fit in this conversation? Everywhere, I guess, is the, is the way to think about it. You know, Latinos have this very, um, very unique, very unique is, a, is a oxymoron. I mean, either it is or it isn't. It's like pregnancy. Um, a unique status of, of having uh, had the northern half of the country of Mexico stolen from Mexico in war and incorporated into the United States, including incorporating a lot of people in it, with them. Who, and as part of that arrangement in 1848, you get this um, full citizenship, at least legally, for people of Mexican background, Mexican descent. So they're legally white, but in practice, they're not. They're socially and culturally and economically discriminated against, but in varying ways with class differences and differences in, in sort of skin tone and racial demography among people who are seen as coded as Latino, which is why when you're Latino today, you can be any race, right? We finally figured that much out at least. Although who knows 100 years from now how we'll look back and say those were pretty stupid census questions about race and ethnicity in you know, we always think we have it figured out now, you know, that, that people who asked, who assumed that Latinos were a race 20 years ago in the 1980 census, that they, they were dumb and now we've figured that out. You know, they could be anything, right? But who knows what it'll look like 80 years from now. We'll have finally figured out that humanity is one great race, maybe. Hard to know. But so, so Latinos have this really remarkable status in there. And um, in some ways that makes them a particularly great example of this business of watching this status both rise and also over time, but also continually be uh, pushed back against because of this peculiar border that the US has with Mexico. And what's peculiar about it is the steepness of the gradient. Between, it's the steepest gradient of any border in the world in economic terms, between the average income of people north of the border and average income of people south of the border. There is nothing like this. If you, if you think about all the immigrant uh, crisis, the refugees flowing out of um, 
Africa and the Middle East, especially in 2015 as the Syrian civil war accelerated and flowing up into Europe, there's not a single place. People are like, well, well they get to Turkey and that's better and then they try to get to Greece and that's better and they try to get to Hungary and, right, and it's sort of step steps to get to Germany or to get to Sweden or to the UK or something. But for the US, it's all one big border, boop. Uh, unless Texas gets away with that secession that I had that slide for. Yeah, I mean, that would change. But, but it, right now, and so there's, that's a distinctive part of the US story with Latinos. So there's, it's kind of like a continual aggravation of the challenge of Latino status is this constant reminder of a, of a weaker status that comes with being impoverished and desperate as refugees are, particularly from Central America today. And of course, mainstream American society has little ability or interest in distinguishing between Hondurans and Mexicans or you know, whoever, whoever else, much less you know, young men and, and women with young children. You were really kind to send that softball down the middle there. I've done, I've done poorly. I hope, it was, I hope it was at least a bunt single. OK, thanks. Um, yes, I wanted to uh, ask a little bit about uh, one thing you mentioned a couple different times throughout your topic, which was um, there's this view that other people are the, uh, want to be American or want to have what Americans have. Mm -hmm. And this seems like a bit of imperial hubris. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking of like recent examples, Afghanistan, we seem to not understand the role of Taliban or of the Taliban in society. In Iraq, we didn't understand the role of religion with the Shia and the Sunni. Um, and then we, um, in the Arab Spring with Egypt, we somewhat abandon our uh, former support for their leaders. And then when they don't elect who we want, the Muslim Brotherhood were upset. So my question is, as America moves forward, how do we understand um, other societies? But not only that, how do we apply that to them and make a sound and informed decision on foreign policy? Great. Terrific question. And not from the history department. Uh, so um, the first thing is to learn languages. Above all else, we have to learn languages besides English. Um, for example, the first 1,000 diplomatic personnel into Iraq in 2003 included out of the 1,000, six of them spoke Arabic. You know, which is, an, so of course, I mean, the, the idea that Americans won't understand what's going on in Iraq, well, they, they have no idea. They're carrying these little, tra these little portable translators around with them, that there's some hilarious journalists reporting on how they would try to talk, how American soldiers in the field are trying to talk to Iraqis who don't speak English. The, um, and the U.S. benefits from this, you know, growth of English as a global language, so much so that we, you know, in schools, we increasingly don't require people to, have foreign language training of any kind. In the university, I'd like to think we're still holding on to that. Although I'd be happy if it were, if it were higher and we required people to live abroad for all the economic complications that that brings. I mean, mostly to me, it is about understanding the rest of the world. And Americans are very bad at this. Are we worse than other peoples? A little bit. Because two things really operate against us. And one is the isolationism of having oceans on both sides and an English-speaking neighbor to the north and neighbors to the south who learn a heck of a lot of English in order to deal either with American tourists coming down or to survive in Texas or Arizona on their way up. Uh, and, but the other one is that, you know, is that the United States has just, has benefited so much from essentially following on the, in the wake of the British Empire, right, which established English as uh, in the place of what used to be French as the international language of commerce and diplomacy up into the middle of the 19th century. And that begins to shift toward, Brit toward the British, and the Americans absorb that. And Americans, in their usual kind of, I'm, I'm grossly generalizing, but there's some truth to this, in, in our usual kind of oblivious, friendly way, we just sort of assume, well, of course the world speaks English. Why wouldn't they? I mean, that's, that's like everybody's language, isn't it? I mean, go to the, I mean, they have 75 or 77 percent of internet postings are in English. I mean, in all of the movies you see all over the world, Start out in English, even if they're subtitled. You know, you know the ways that Americans see themselves abroad are very easily kind of mirrored back to them in ways that make them feel good about themselves in some way. But of course, then the real push comes to shove when the U.S. actually engages in military conflict uh, abroad and and hits people who really are not happy about the U.S. showing up. And then you always have the same patterns <laughs> of rethinking this. It's sort of like what happens in the night early. 1970s, late 1960s, when Americans for the first time realized that large numbers of Vietnamese did not want the United States to be there. And then we had to sort of learn about guerrilla warfare and why it was that 
that it was hard to defeat a guerrilla uh, force in, in another land that Americans didn't know much about that was 7,000 miles away. And then when we get the same problem in Afghanistan in, from 2001 on and in Iraq from 2003 on, you get the same patterns. It's shocking, the patterns of you'd get uh, little publications in military journals and also in non-military journals about the importance of learning how to think about guerrilla warfare. It's like everybody was asleep for the last 40 years. It's, it's stunning to me that this, the replication about this, our failure to learn in that. And honestly, the, 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 the success for this, the, the, the solution to this is right here. It's in the university. It's in Chancellor Green's university. I mean, this is where it's going to happen. I'm serious. I mean, it's when college students are demand more truthful uh, uh, behavior and words from their elected presidents. We've seen that happen, and we've seen it happen powerfully in the late 1960s. Um, when they do that, and when they demand honesty about not understanding other countries and a determination to learn about them, that's how we got Vietnamese studies in the United States. That's how we got Vietnamese language uh, programs was only after, you know, going through that. And so hopefully, we've done the same with Arabic. So. The simple answer is we need to learn Arabic. We need to learn Mandarin. And we need to learn Spanish, of course, but you know, every every possible foreign language. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah. How do we fix this amnesia? Yeah. Take history. Don't follow uh, don't follow the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Aren't they the people who, who who got rid of their history major, at least temporarily? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, America is a is a culture famously forward looking, and it's part of what's charming about the United States. And other people love it because it's, you know, we're the land of second chances and everybody's always trying to look forward. And, and you know, the past is, well, you know what the phrase means. When we say your history, <laughs> it means you're irrelevant, right? I mean, so it's really quite clear. Or the study that the American Historical Association did about 10 years ago, they, they, they did a big poll uh, of Americans asking them for the word that first came to mind to describe history. And the, by far the, the, the most prevalent one was boring. You know, it's like, let's get on to the future. I can barely handle the present, but the future is exciting. You know, and the past is just so, you know, and of course, uh, uh, it's not that other people need to take history. It's that we need to teach and write history better. Right. I mean, that's, the, I mean, we need to get out of our own little channels of doing our, our treasured research on these narrow little topics that don't engage bigger issues. And we need to quit giving long, boring lectures that you nicely just sat through, but, and you act like you're still interested. It's awesome. You guys, did you pay these people? It's wonderful. You know, it's just great. It's, so, I mean, it's in the teaching and the learning. You know, I mean, I really do believe that. And obviously, that's true at the, it's at the middle school, high school levels, as, just as much as at the university level. That, that's where the work will... God, I sound like an, uh, uh, somebody in education, don't I? I mean, I really do believe this is where we, this is where we got to work from. Yeah. I think we'll take our. Is that a, a stretch or a hand? <laughs> <laughs> our last question for the great, afternoon great. will come there from the back. Hi. Th uh, thank you for the talk. It was. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know if these are actually interesting questions. So, like, my first question is, do you think of, like, Americana, you know, the cultural anemia, do you think of it as a fundamentally progressive project of sorts, or is it something else? And uh, secondly, when it comes to, like, the civic nationalism that America has, is it, like, a uniquely American phenomenon, or are other countries capable of that? Boy, those are good questions. <laughs> okay, so the first one, Americanness. Uh, as I tried to suggest, it's both universalistic and inclusive, and it's also profoundly parochial and ignorant of the rest of the world. And that's, that's my overwhelming feeling about the country that I live in, is that we're spectacularly attractive in so many ways and painfully ignorant and unself-aware in so many ways. And you, you, know, you get this from any thinking person you deal with who is from another country and spends much time in the US. They're like, boy, you people are great in so many ways, and you're just so out of it in so many ways. And it's both. I don't see a way around it. That's the American vision of the world, as I understand it. And I mean, it, it keeps me up at night worrying about it, but it also, I don't see a resolution. I, it feels like those are, it's sort of like having two parts of your personality. 
you know, that, that as a nation that we have. Civic nationalism, um, you know, other, other nations have their own versions of this. I mean, certainly the French are the ones right now we're watching with uh, this emphasis on laicite, their, their, you know, secular origins and the question how that operates when you have increasingly resurgent religious communities within, you know, whether it's Roman Catholic or Jewish or, or Muslim or anything else. Um, and so other nations, I think, wrestle with their own versions of that, but they don't all have a constitution like ours, which was, you know, constructed to not be a Christian nation, as that early treaty that Washington signed with um, one of the North African nations uh, that we were engaged in war with over piracy. The treaty said something to the effect of the United States, I don't have any, I'm paraphrasing slightly, is not a Christian nation. You know, in other words, I mean, it's really quite clear, despite the fantasies of right wing um, people who imagine they're, that the Christian faith is somehow embedded in the in the Constitution. It's, it's very much in the culture in which the Constitution emerges from, absolutely. But that Constitution is so secular in its fundamentals that, that I think that's a, a big part of what makes our civic nationalism different. Yeah. Thank you all for your questions. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.